It's a great honor and a privilege to introduce um, Hannah, Anika, Wilson, Ringer, and uh, Rachel, Rachel, Stringer. And we're here in your beautiful home in Yerushalayim. And you were born both in, in Antwerp. We were both born in Antwerp, yes. During the war, uh, just before the war. End of, uh, my sister was born end of 37 and I was born end of 38. And we had a lovely home, we were all very happy. My parents had a beautiful home there. My mother actually came from Vienna. Uh, near Pappenheim, which was quite a known family name because my grand, great grandfather was one of the founders of Agudat Israel. And my father was left Krakow when he was just a few months old. They went to live in Scheveningen, which is in Holland. And when he was six years of age, they came to live in Antwerp. So everything was fine until the Nazi period started. Um, we had a relative in Switzerland, in St. Gallen, who provided us with false passports from Paraguay, South Americans. And I think it was, um, it was given by a Portuguese consul, if I'm not mistaken. And so we had those passports which were supposed to save us. We were at the time three children, my sister, me, and a brother who was born in 40. Um, everything was fine until 42. And then the razzia started in Antwerp. People were taken away. Also people who had uh, American passports were taken away and uh, my father was taken as a hostage I think in about uh, the 42 or the middle of 42 afterwards because first our oh, grandparents were yes. deported yes my grandparents for some reason didn't get that passport I don't know why now before that before that people in Antwerp tried to run away to um, France this was in 41, so I England, think. Okay. No, they went to France. They wanted, to get, wanted to, France. to get to, to No, England. they tried to get to the border of France. And they reached, I think it was Dunkerque. And when they arrived there, the, the English had arrived by sea. But they were met by the Nazis. So one couldn't get out anymore. One couldn't get either to England or to France. So they all tried to get back to Antwerp because nothing was done there. And then my grandparents were still with us. My mother was pregnant with uh, my brother. And somehow they started their way back to Antwerp and there were no um, cars available and so on. But somehow my mother got a bit of a lift until they arrived at a place, a Geisha place, what was it? Uh, Saint uh, Anne or something. Saint Anne or something, but it was a convent. A, a convent. And they stayed there for the night. We stayed there, you also. Yeah, we all we stayed also. there for the we night. And there. I think our grandparents were also there no, with us. No, they didn't come with us. They didn't come with us? They I didn't come with us. We were. I, uh, my father and Uncle Siegfried uh, were in another place, they were not with us. In the so uh, uh, our father wasn't with us? He was not with us. So we were the two girls and my mother and we landed in this convent. Now the Nazis started bombing the whole area and some of the rooms in this convent were touched and the ceiling, the ceiling started falling to pieces. And my mother was stay, saying tell him there. So the nuns asked her if she could stay with them during the war because she, they thought she was a saint. And because of her, the convent was saved. But she said she can't stay because she's expecting. And maybe it's going to be a boy. And if it's a boy, she needs a male. 
to do the bris mila. So somehow we got back to Antwerp, and my brother was born in Antwerp, and he still has his bris mila. Um, then, a few, my in the meantime, my uh, grandparents were taken by the Gestapo because they didn't have those false passports. And about a year later, when my mother was expecting my younger brother, um, my father was taken away to a hostage camp in Germany. It was actually not hostage. They call it Schutzhaft, you know, in order to protect him from the Alliés, because of course the Paraguay, they were Alliés to uh, the Nazis. So they took the people, they called it Schutzhaft. That means that to protect, protect them it. from the Spanish and from the English and so on, which was ridiculous because actually it was a work camp. And he was taken after my grandparents were unfortunately taken. We were in the room when the Gestapo came. I was there in the room when my grandparents were taken. I remember that taken. as well. You know, when you are young and very terrible things happen, then even if you're only two or three years of age, you do remember. And I remember my father telling the police officer there, aren't you ashamed to let this old woman schlep her case on her own? So he said, oh, entschuldigung, yeah. And he took the case, because at the time they thought they were going just to be deported to Poland, but they were sent straight away to Auschwitz. And they were to Me no, they were in Mechelen. Mechelen first, of course, and yeah. from Mechelen. And Mechelen was, was terrible. Yeah. And uh, they were killed. On my father always used to keep his yurt side on the day they arrived in Auschwitz because I don't think they had any chance. They must have been in their late 50s, I think. Yeah? We, we heard about it afterwards because, you know, in Mechelen, Mechelen was a little city. It was actually a place for soldiers, and they throw it out. The soldiers was a caserne for it. Mm. I was and in that museum. Have you been there? Of course. Yeah. And there we, because actually we never saw, we never knew if or when our pa grandparents were deported. And now uh, that um, in Mechelen, what we did know, everything was very once, uh, um, they were very ordered. They wrote everything. Also, we saw there's a big wall there, but the three pictures meters are high, with all the pictures. So also, also the Siegfried was on the picture there. Did you see that? I don't I think. No, it's different. Yes. I saw the picture. Yeah. Uh, yes, I remember. Yeah. Yes, but by because at the time, the Nazis wrote letters to the Jewish youth and said, show us that you are not Parasiten. Parasites. 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 Right? Yeah. So come and work for us. And my father used had a terrible quarrel with Siegfried, who was 15 or 16 years of age, and he told him, don't come, don't go, because you are going to get caught there. But he wouldn't listen, he went and we never saw him again. Uh, it, it was a little bit different. It was like this. They I said saw the picture. The, I know. Whole, the whole story is there in I know, but I, 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 I remember when we brought him to the, to the truck. My mother get, went there with my sister and me, so I was there. Uh, they, they called him Siegfried, and it was like this, that um, they, they said that every family needs to send somebody to work. And then my other uncle, who was a little older, Nebisch, who was 18 when he, when, he, when he was... He's the one who was in, in Transy, you know, in France, who was rejected from Switzerland. He w yes, he, he went straight to Auschwitz. But now let's say it first to Siegfried. So Siegfried said, well, you want to go, you can't go. You have, uh, you have three si children, let me go. And then he went there, and I remember exactly how he knew, looked. I remember his gray coat and his gray um, casket, and he had, um, you know, a backpack on his side, and he saw him running to the truck, and it was the last time we saw him. Because from all these transport, not one came back. Afterwards, we learned that the, we heard that they, they worked until they were just passed away. Because what why didn't they, they give him a chance to work at that age? Normally, young people were allowed to work. In, they, in did work. they did work. They did but work, and then probably they were exhausted because they were too young. 
And so then when they saw that they are not really then producing, then uh, they just... Uh, and my other uncle, uh, it was Uncle Adolf, who was uh, older, and he, this was a very tragic story. That's the story I told you before, that he was rejected from Switzerland. It, it was like that he had, as if he had an invitation from the cousins that were living in St. Gallen that sent him an invitation that he would could come to them and he the uh, they would take they would take care of him. Yes, now his first name was Adolf, and the this uh, document came in the hand of an other man who was also named Adolf, but not Pappenheim. Now the other man knew exactly that it's not for him. And somehow he didn't manage to get it back, I don't know what. So anyhow, so he was with nothing, he was in Brussels, he was uh, working. And he came often to, to Antwerp, we were very happy when he came, so because he was playing with us and we had a big fun with him. And uh, um, then one day he said to my mother that, uh, listen, I start to be afraid. I don't go out without my filling anymore. I want to try to escape to Switzerland. And uh, he tried. Twice he came until to the border and uh, then he couldn't come in. And then he get to Geneva. And he was caught by the police. Then he said, it was at the time of, of cell phones, and of phones at all, he said to the border, I have the letters at home, Nadia, uh, for the report from Nochim Sternbuch. And then he said, let me call my cousins in St. Gallen because they're inviting me. They did not let him call, it was his death. And then I remember that it was written, uh, Pappenheim wurde sogar unhöflich. Pappenheim even become, became unpolite, imagine. He was fighting for his life. So they threw him out uh, straight to the, to, the, to the hands of the... Um, uh, uh, to he, he went, went to, uh, to, uh, to, to Auschwitz. No, first he was in, in France. He was caught in Drancy and sent to Auschwitz. No, he was, uh, yes, yeah. and then I knew the man, there was a certain man, he was a friend of uh, of Bom, of Papi, uh, Mr. Merzen. And they, you know, they learned together yeah. in the Cosmetics in Antwerp. And I visit this very gentleman here in uh, in Jerusalem until the day of his death. It was a huge town with Rochem. And he told me he was already a habitué in Auschwitz. He survived in Auschwitz may, nearly three years, it was absolutely outstanding and he knew already all the secrets and then he saw Adolf, Uncle Adolf working there and he said, Adolf, what are you doing here? I said, well I'm here. He said, what can I do for you? And he said, I'm freezing, I'm freezing, I'm so cold. Then he said, don't worry, I get you a sweater because he knew already, you know, never from all the people. And the next day he came with a sweater but he died from pneumonia. Oh, yeah. So there was a story from uh, Uncle Adolf, very tragic. My mother, there were seven children, two brothers and five daughters, and only two survived, my mother and her youngest sister, who was also in, and in Belgium. She was hidden in Belgium, and at a certain time, my sister and me, we landed where she was, she, where she was working as a goiter, and we arrived there, it was an orphanage. She was, you know, she was in the washroom and she was washing, uh, um, you know, um, laundry. There were no machines. And um, this Madame Sorel, Mademoiselle Sorel. She it, is written in the, uh, here in Yad Vashem. I know. That's why Yad Vashem came to me, because my, my granddaughter <laughs> was in Yad Vashem and they told about Mademoiselle Sorel. Was she Did the uh, a Goisha lady that... She was a Goisha uh, lady, lady. So and same, she, she same got more her, than 60 uh, children. And then my granddaughter heard from Mademoiselle Sorel and said, well, my, my grandmother has been there. I said, what? And she did not, and that's how they came to me. We landed there from Anagoy because there were razzias 
You know what the razzia was then when they were knocking at the door to try to get the Jews out. So my father was warned of the coming razzia, and that's why he wanted my sister and me to go to a goy for a certain time. Now there were very righteous goyim living in L Luxembourg. In no, no, in Limburg. In, in Limburg. 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 Which is about a mine. The coal mines. He was an engineer from the coal yeah. mines. And they the knew Jewish him mines. because in the beginning of the war, all the people from Austria or Germany were sent to this place. And this Mr. Juchmanns looked after them. He was Mamesh Tzadik. So through that, my parents knew of him. And my father wrote to him, can we send the children for a while to you because of the Ratsyats which are going to take place. So we went, my sister and me, we went to those people who were very, very nice. And people. how old were you when you went? Sorry? How old were you? About three or four. You were three and a half and I was four and a half. And you remember? Like yeah, yeah of think. course. I, I remember that as well. They were very nice to us. The only thing I remember is that they wanted us to eat conanches. How do you say conanches? Rabbits. Uh, rabbits. Oh, yeah. And I said, I'm not eating. And my sister said, you have to do it. Uh, my mother said, said you have to do it. And I said, I'm eat. not eating that. It was like a sweet thing. <laughs> Anyhow, we survived that as well. But then one day they asked my sister, what's your name? And then she said, well, now I'm called Rachel. But after the war, I'll be in Ruchel again. And this was the end of our career there. And that's why we were sent to Mademoiselle Sorin. So can when I ask, I, when you <laughs> went there, how did you go? Did you go on a train or? No, my mother brought us to until Mechelen. And then Mr. and Mrs. Juchmann came to take us. To now I remember us. her very well. She was crying. And she, I know even the, the, the coat she had on. And then she said to me, she said, listen, you have to be very nice, obeyful. You need to eat everything. Don't make stories. And one thing don't forget. Before you go to sleep, when when they close the door, you have to say Shema with your, with your sister because that's very, very important. And which I did every evening. And one evening, uh, Anneke didn't want to say it. I said, you know, you have to. She said, but I'm tired. And then I burst in, in tears and I said, don't you know that this is the most important? And then uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mrs. Jürgen came in. They were very worried what happened. Then I said, oh, I just had a bad dream. And where, where, was, where you went, where was it situated? It was a part of Belgium? In Limburg. Limburg. Uh, in Limburg, it's a part of Belgium. this is a part of so the coal mines. And when you said goodbye to your mother, was it, it must have been very traumatic. It must have been very We difficult. didn't understand actually what's going on. We knew that we go there for a while and we have to be very obedient and eat everything and be nice. That's all what we knew. My mother always tried to... Not to scare us. Not to scare us. It was incredible. Afterwards, when my father was taken away already and so on, and there were flying bombs in Antwerp, then, you know, people, when they were flying bombs, they used to go to the cellar, you know, like a kind of a miklak, because there was no miklak. But then some people were buried alive in the cellars. So she decided whenever those bombs go, we go to the roof. And one day, there were those terrible bombs, and they fell on a gasometer. But it was after the war then. Huh? No matter when it was. Yes. And my mother said, oh, there are fireworks, just enjoy it, because she never wanted us to be afraid. She was a very, very special woman, and she never showed the Nazis that she's afraid. And she used to joke with them in German. And they said, how come a lady from Paraguay speaks such a good German? She said, just she was laughing it off. Of course, inside herself, she wasn't laughing, but she never showed them any fear. And because of that, I think my sister and me and all of us weren't so marked, because... Wow. But actually, it was like that. I was scared to death. death. I was terribly scared. And I knew that you don't speak about it and you don't show it. In order to show you what my sister said now, after my grandparents were taken away, there was a law that if somebody has been deported, 
then all his belongings go to the Deutsches Reich. So then they, they came, they were actually Belgians with a big, big truck to take out whatever was uh, remained. I love the story of the green couch. That's exactly yeah. <laughs> what I'm going to tell now. So uh, my uh, mother has said, listen, children, you know, they come just and take away some stuff. Of, of course, they took some more stuff, yes. And there was a green couch that she always hated. She said to us, listen, children, Finally, we get rid of this green couch. Then when they finish all their work, of course, they take whatever they wanted to take. Then my mother said, um, this couch you have to take. They said, no, we are not interested in this couch. It looks already terrible. She said, what? And then after you will tell us that we took something from Deutsches Reich, no, 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 you take it. We were looking at the window and then they schlepped out this. You know, this we had those old houses with very, very narrow stairs and it was very difficult to get anything out. So those two people had to schlep this horrible couch and it, it, there were feathers or something in that everything fell out and there were, you know... On the street, <laughs> on the street yeah. actually the whole, uh, the the whole, whole couch collapsed. went apart. So and my mother felt she won a victory over, over the Nazis. And so she we said, you see, now terrace. we are rid of the great now. So we thought we it, made it was really yeah, very... Yeah. And so also once she hid for a very short time some people that were fleeing away, that afterwards unfortunately were caught. And then my little brother was already born, Ailey was a baby. And uh, then they came in the night, the Belgian police, the Belgian police, and they said that she's hiding people. She said, you can go and look. And of course, we were scared to death, you know, the police coming in middle of the night, and so. And then they went to search everywhere, and then they went to look in the, in the cradle of my little brother. And then she took us, she said, you see how stupid they are? Could you imagine that an adult person is going to, to hide in there? They're so stupid, they're so stupid. And we were laughing there. How can you go and look for an adult people in the cradle? So that was my mother. You know, she was really exceptional in that, that she managed always to give us a super Jewish education. And uh, despite there was nothing, there were no Jews, there were no books, there were nothing. I can tell you that at the end of the war, immediately first time, first thing she did was taking when somebody came back, uh, Mr. Salomon, I think his name was, to teach us uh, to, to read. At the end of the war, I was about, I don't know, maybe uh, six or something like that. I knew the whole story of the Tanakh, from A to Z. She we entertained the, us with those stories. Everything. We knew the whole benching, the Shema, all the, all the uh, Broches. I knew as much as another child that has been to, to first class. Now, in the beginning of the war, there were some Jewish people who went to hospitals, even to have surgery in order not to be uh, sent away because in the beginning if someone was sick he wasn't taken away to Auschwitz and so on. So my mother used to go there every day, used to cook a big pot of soup and bring it to the people who wanted to eat kosher in that um, in the hospital. Uh, how she did it I don't know. She used to put this pot in in the carriage well, it was, you know, like a bit, you remember yeah. how they brought <laughs> milk yeah. in those such as, I don't know where she organized and one of, that. And the, my brother was sitting in the carriage and we had to walk mm. there, which was quite a bit of a distance. Yeah, for because us it even, was very... No, really because normal. I remember after the war even, it was at least half an hour walk. Yeah. And with this hot yeah. soup and the baby inside the carriage. And yeah, she went there every day to give food to the people. And one day... My sister, for some reason. No, 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 no. Yeah. You tell the story not quite. I'll tell you yeah. how it was. One day, the lady that was cleaning with us and that came often to a tzaddeket, because a she, lady. real a Gosh lady, she, um, the diamonds that my father gave to her, she was a very simple Paul. She, she was buried them. She buried them, them under the rabbit cages. 
and she really gave them back after the war. And it was one day that she said to my mother, listen, I cannot see as you're slapping every day this thing and with the children you never have a day off. You know what, I take the three big children, that means uh, me, myself, I'm the oldest, my sister and, and Benny and the other the other brother and she with the baby so at least you know you can be you don't need to to slip so much before i went out the door i said to to my mother but you don't go to the hospital without us she says okay it's fine and then she got herself ready and then she said but i promise her shell that i will not go to the hospital and then she said shall i go shall i not go shall i go shall i not go she said come on i can't leave these people without food i'm going so she came there an hour late and when she came there then the people said mrs ringer there was a razzia here the nazis were there get away immediately because they come back would wow. you have come on time she wouldn't have come home. that's unbelievable yeah what a, a uh, what a nice, that's really a nice. It was really a nice, yes. And what happened to your father? My father was taken away in 43, I think it was, when my, her, when my mother was expecting my younger brother who didn't make it tonight because of the Afghan. And um, he was taken as a hostage. She calls it something else. Schutzhaft, they, called, they it called it. They hostage. called it Schutzhaft. But it was a hostage in a German camp. And my mother was left all on her own with three children and the fourth on the way who was born at home because Jewish people couldn't go to hospitals. And then my father gave away because he saw already there were two, three people. One were neighbors. I, I don't uh, remember exactly their names. They had some stuff or stuff that he gave away. And there was a family fun loan. Now the grandparents fun loan, let's say, or the for parents fun loan, they're quite simple people. And they were very, very proud of their son because he was a teacher in a high school. And his wife was, they were not Jews of course, she was uh, a, a teacher in the, garden, in teacher. the kindergarten, the Jewish kindergarten. And to him, my father brought money and said, listen, if they take me, if there's something, the money will be with you so my, my wife can go and take it. Uh, he also this gave silverware. Full, and, and some silverware and, and other very good stuff. And the, uh, this foreign of my grandparents, thanks God, were also given away, otherwise it would have come away. They were given to the the grandparents, the, the parents, <coughs> and when my mother was pregnant, she was she was not allowed anymore to go with a tramway or with a bus. She had to go by foot. So I remember the day because I saw I saw her coming home. Madame Maria was with us, and she was came there. She went to Mr. Fanon to the teacher, you know, <coughs> and she said, "I'm coming to get." I so he said, "I lost the money." He said he was burgled. She said, uh, could you lose the money? He said, said it was, was burgled. A, yeah, okay. Then I remember I, I saw her coming on the street and she was crying on the street. Now she was alone with three children, very soon having a baby without nothing. And I remember that there were people on the street that asked you, what is with you? Can we do something? Did you lose something? She said nothing. The day afterwards, Bobon, we called the mother of Van Loon. Bobon is like, uh, you know, grandmother or granny or something. Bobon came to our house crying. And she said, Mrs. Ringer, I think that my son did something very not nice. I was in his house and his whole house is with new furniture. Oy. Then I ask him, how can you make new furniture in the war? And he said, it's not your business. Take care of your own business. Then she said, I don't know what happened, but as much as I can help, I will continue to help. And she really was coming often too. I remember, the, uh, especially after the war, in the moment that in the time until everything settled, there were the bumps of what my sister said before, it was after the war, 
there was no food map to get in, in, in Antwerp until, you know, everything was a little bit organized. Then I remember that my mother, that was the day of the liberation, she cracked down. Then she, could, she just had a breakdown. She was, had high fever and um, she couldn't get up. She couldn't stay there very long like that. And um, then she came with a little package of petit beurre. You know, these little uh, cookies. And I remember this petit beurre and actually it was the food that we had on this day until then the other story started with um, what was after the liberation where again my mother had been... Actually in the street where we lived, in the same house where my grandparents lived, everyone knew that we were Jewish and that we were not... Uh, Did they know? Well the, 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 the non-Jews, the, and they never, they never informed? No, they didn't. No. That's actually quite amazing that they... There were other people who were sold by, by Goish people for 20 francs. But my saint and nobody. My, uh, my father had good relations also, do you remember, with the. Uh, this one, uh, the police, yeah. uh, the police. Uh, the but he, anyhow, he but it had nothing them. to do with that. The two people in the street knew us and no one. Uh, so just to tell her, you know, once uh, the, the children were, we were playing there and they asked me which nationality we are. And then I came home to my mother and say, listen, they ask, you know, I didn't know what is the difference between nationality or religion or something like that. It was too small. So the, uh, she said, the ch children ask me uh, which nationality we are. Shall I say that we are Jews? And then you know every other one. Are you crazy? She said, my mother said, why, why would you say that? Why don't you say just that we are Belgian? Oh, I say, very good. So I went out and I said, we are Belgian, which we were not, because we were Staatenlos. Staatenlos means without any... Um, uh, Officially, but we had the Paraguay thing. Yes, that's it, but um, this probably she didn't want to say or whatever, I don't know what. But she said, just tell them that we are Belgian. And did your father come back? Yeah, Thanks but he came back in '46. In '46. But he was first sent for some reason, which I never understood, in to Algeria. Algeria. Yeah, there he had a very bad time. And they had difficulties. Now, what I wanted to tell you that all many people in Antwerp got those Paraguayan papers, and also the Rottenberg family because they were related to Recha. Recha was a Rottenberg from home. Now, what happened was that the man were sent to to, the, to this place uh, as hostages, and the older men and the women and the children were sent to a place which was called Vitel in France, which was supposed to be a place where they would be looked after. And for some reason, my mother never got the papers to get accepted there together with the children. So she kept asking, why am I not sent there? because she also wanted to be in a protected place. Then in the middle of the war, she got two letters in one day. One day telling her, a, a letter from the Nazis, that they have been accepted to Vitel. If she wants to go, she can go. And another letter from my father, which he sent, I think, from this German place. And he said, dear uh, Liana, how are you, blah, blah, blah. I know that you love to visit sick people and you wanted to go and visit your Uncle Tivel, but you should know that Uncle Tivel is very sick and he has a contagious disease, so don't go and visit him. And she understood, you know, Vitel Tivel and so on. So she wrote a letter to the Nazis and said, thank you very much for the permission, but I decided I prefer to stay here. And we heard that uh, Ralph Rottenberg and his wife and all the children were, they were all sent to Auschwitz and all killed. And there were many people that jumped out of the window and actually made suicide. Committed. And mm -hmm. one of the committed suicide and one of the people that jumped out of the window and that survived yes. was Recha, Recha Sternbuch. Uh, Recha jumped, Recha jumped and she was very young and seemed that she made it. She was and Recha Sternbuch who, who... No, not Recha. Uh, not, not Recha. Uh, the, the, no, not the, the, the Recha wife of Eli. The wife of Eli. Which Eli? Eli Sternbuch. Eli Sternbuch was the brother of Nochim. Yeah, I know. 
But she was she was the one who provided me no, with all not the No, not I, I am sorry. Guter Sternbuch. Guter. Guter Sternbuch. Guter Sternbuch jumped and survived. So I want to ask you, um, when you were taken to by the coal mines to the Scotia family. Well, lovely man. Um, Very lovely. How long did you stay there? I think a few months. months. I think a few months. I don't know. And were you in touch with your mother? Could you get any letters or? No, we couldn't no, write no, by no, that no, time. So, you, we so you, you did. <laughs> we were but did you get any messages how no, your mother was? No. And the, in that time when we were there happened actually a big, big miracle that my parents told me. When my father knew about the razzia, then uh, uh, this policeman said, because then only my little brother, uh, the third one, so not the last one, was not born yet, was at home and he said, get the child out of the house. Because when they would start knocking the door, he would cry. And then it was already not far from this seven in the evening. Talking, it was not seven far. So my father, could not get out anymore to bring him to family fun loan. The, the people that afterwards stole our money, but they saved the, the, child. They saved the child. So he went to, there was a man at the, um, we had a very what nice, uh, uh, quite a Macaulay grocery story, and uh, it were Louis and Bertha, and he went there and he said, listen, uh, could you bring my, my, my little boy to family fun loan because there will be a razzia this evening and I would try not to open the door but he will cry if they start knocking at the door and then he took him you know in such a little wagon and he brought him to, to fun loan so the child was out and then they started knocking at the door now you must know that our entrance door we always said this door is terrible it's going to crack down it doesn't hold you know it was shaking it was and they started knocking at the door. Of course, my father didn't open. Now, my father and my mother were in the upper part. They were uh, sleeping there. And my aunt was still in the house. And after a while, she crawled to my parents. Uh, and she says, like, I can't do it anymore. Okay. I, I opened the door. I, I, I cannot steal. Then my father said, if you open the door, I kill you. He said, "You don't. Oh, I'm not said, going I'll to open that. You. <laughs> I'm. I'm not. I'm not going to open that the door." And then they came from the other time. They came with, you know, with lights, but they were laying on the floor, so they were under the light. And after an hour or two, they just got away. And the and this door that was so bad break down. <laughs> didn't break down. And so. the same aunt afterwards was in this orphanage of Mademoiselle Sorel. So when we were sent there, she was there as a guide. So I want to ask you about this, this uh, Sorel, this, this lady that you went yeah. Do you remember going? I hated the place, I remember. I mean, how, so how, long, how long did you, were you Not there? Not very long, I don't know how long. I tell you what the difficulties were. I don't At know that why time, I hated this place very much. In Leuven. In it Leuven. was terrible. Uh, I tell you what. I tell you why it was so. Was it in, for us. in Antwerp? No, 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 in Louvain, in Leuven. There were these famous universities. In Louvain, there's a very good university. I tell you what the difficulty was. When we were at in Limburg, they were speaking Flemish. By that time, we only spoke f spoke Flemish and not yet French. And there in Louvain, they were Everyone speaking was French, and we didn't understand the word. So, you know, we are completely lost there with all these children and this lady with a very... She was a rough very, lady, but she, uh, so, she saved the children. She saved but the as children. children we, we, but, you know, she was telling all kinds of things we, we didn't understand. Wow. So we felt very... Um, Rejected. Um, but we met our aunt there because she was working there as a goiter. So I think this sort of helped us a bit, but you know, it's quite uh, vague, you know, when you are three years old. And were there other little children that you made friends with? There were there? No, absolutely uh, not. I had no idea, we don't un didn't understand. I remember there also that I didn't like the food and I was, and I was sitting with all these children at the table, didn't understand the word, I felt like in a Kafka situation. I thought it was in Coxit. wasn't it in Coxit? It was in Louvain. 
I thought it was a cocoon. So how roughly you were there for maybe a few months? We don't know exactly. You don't know. I don't remember. No. And then what happened after they? What? Then we went back home to my parents. And then it. it Did they come and fetch no, you? No, or? no. I don't know who got us there. To say the truth, my father was away already because he was taken in this time. And then my mother was pregnant, and then happened the story with the money. And uh, now my mother was really, what what will we do? So this. Uh, Can you cover this, yourself? Thank you. This, uh, this um, cleaning, cleaning lady that took us, took, took us us for a Maria. day of a vacation, Maria. She, um, um, uh, what, what we did I want? Yes, then my mother gave her all the silverware, the antique beauty, antique beauty, to sell it to the, um, uh, to, to the people there around. Now they had no clue how uh, that was very, but we had to have food. So whatever, she was really wonderful, this mother Maria. I think we never thanked her enough for, for being so good to us. We didn't realize that she kept us alive. And um, then there was still the Centrale, you know, there was a place where Jewish, Jews were m m meeting. And there my mother met a nurse that had, was half Jewish, I, I don't know if her father or whatever, every, because she was not officially Jewish and not officially Goish, so she had no coupon. Now if you had no coupon, you couldn't get any food, even if you had money. She was starving, literally starving. So my mother said, listen, you know what, we are not eating, you can not eat with us, but please come to my house and help me for the birth. And so she stayed with us till the end of the war. And my mother had, by that time, she had another 200 francs. And with that, she bought two kilos of potatoes and 100 grams of uh, butter, well, something very, and she said, with that, you have then to, 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 to keep me up um, after the birth. And then she stayed with us, and my mother felt that, yes, now there was, we were in one room, and my, my mother had around, there was no key. It will, um, we were very well educated and we were not allowed to get out of our beds until we were allowed. And then there was one morning that we said, it's so annoying, why can we not get up? Why we cannot get up? We can never get out of a bed without permission. And we also, there, there's a man is walking around there and saying something. We didn't know what it was. Actually what happened, my mother had to give birth. Now there was no telephone in the house anymore. And then my this zusto, we called it zusto. Zusto means sister. And she at seven o'clock she ran to get the doctor because my mother couldn't go to the hospital. And he came in. And then my baby brother, who is not really baby brother anymore, <laughs> was born. And then my uh, the sister came in and it was, you know, my mother was telling us that soon, soon that we will have a baby and we looked at all the babies in the street, you know, with the nice Beckeloch. And then came something yellow, very skinny, crying. We didn't like it so much because that, that's what came. Yes. You know, his, uh, his bones were... Oh, yeah. Crooked, they went straight because my mother didn't have any food during the war. Anyhow, so she had no calcium. So anyhow, she said, look what the stork brought to us. And then we started laughing about this stupid sister that doesn't know even that the angels bring the babies. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then uh, afterwards, uh, my mother had to feed this baby. And my brother had a good look at him. He was two years old, I think. And he said, okay, we've seen him now. Can you send him back, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> because he really did. And so my mother, job. you know, she had to have some, she, what, what we bought as milk was not milk. But so we she had said, beans. Yeah. My mother bought a few hundred kilos of um, dry beans during the, before the war. And that's really what we lived for. Really? No, but what she was drinking about 15, 16 liters of um, something that she called coffee that she was making with icons and she was just drinking, drinking, drinking until she thought that and something uh, well, came out. But of course this milk was not very, 
and sustain you. So he was always crying because actually he was hungry. Was hungry. So, uh, but, but he made up for it, Baruch Hashem. And then there was a absolutely, uh, you know, he didn't sit up in his bed because he had no strength. He was very cute, he had already, you know, was like that, but he couldn't sit. There was always also uh, already after the war, and I was downstairs in the in the kitchen with my mother, and then was this famous thing what my daughter said that the bomb fell on the gasometer, and then I was there with my mother and my we we knew that his bed was next to the window. Now all the windows in in the house in this moment shuttered. just shuttered, and then we both said Ailey and we run up the stairs and he was standing for the first time in his bed yes. laughing, another you miracle. know, look what I another did, another all another the miracle. bed was full of glass pieces, it was the first time he stood up, he never sat up until then. That's unbelievable. So you see, uh, then Such we had lots well, of crime that we seen within the bigness of staying alive. So was, was your family, involved. your mother and the children, were you the only Yidden in, in Africa officially, at that time? Officially. There were many others, but, but, officially. but officially not. We were not hidden. So I wanted, we were not hidden. So there was one famous story on, on a certain day, also afterwards, after my grandparents were taken, and my mother was out and Madame Maria was in the house. And in that moment, the, uh, the office, the, the Nazis came and they put a seal on all, the, on all the doors except where the kitchen was. And it was Friday. Um, and um, because they said they want to be sure that nothing was left from Deutsches Reich. Now my mother comes home and they said to Madame Marie, who was waiting for us, crying outside, these officers have been here, so scary and so on. And they said they would come back in the evening. Now they didn't come back. And my mother had said, okay, we we'll need to put my children in bed. And then she broke one of the seals that was... Love. Baby broke the seal. Actually. No, she broke one because to put us to sleep. And then Benny, my little brother, said, well, that's fun. And he broke another one. So in the morning, my mother did an amazing thing. She took us with her passports, her grand passport, and went to foot to the Gretri Strat, which was a nice walk, believe me. And we came there in this huge house, and um, she kept, we come there, and they said... The you know, quarters nobody of was the SS. Of, I guess uh, that was of the Wehrmacht, actually. And then she said she wanted to speak with the officers. Now she looked at them. Are you <laughs> who comes to that house? Then they say, okay, the baby you have to leave outside. That was a big house, and the baby was there left outside. Immediately started to cry, quite all the time. And then we went into the room, and there was a, ch a sofa, and my mother was not very tall. And then you, for me, these men were huge. I thought that they were three meters high, probably they were not. And then she said, I come to complain. I yes, I said you come to complain. Yes, listen, you have been in my house. You sealed the doors, and uh, you said you would come in back, and you didn't come. Now I'm not used of that because I know that we you can rely on on German that a, a word is a word. So listen, you must understand. I had to put to sleep my children. No, the little boy thought that I, he can also open one, and he opened one of the seals. And they say, we broke the seal of the Deutsches Reich, and it's your fault. Wow. They just started to laugh. They started to laugh. And then there was a long conversation that I didn't understand. And they said, go home, go home. But remember that we shall never see you, not in a park, or not in a tramway, or not in a bus. And she said, of course, I love to walk by foot. And then we came home, and this very officer was very impressed by my mother. He came often too, and he knocked at the door, and they were speaking there, you know, outside. She German, in a bit. because of my course mother they, was very fluent. In so they were speaking about Goethe and Beethoven, and I don't know mm -hmm. what. And um, then once she asked, he said, "Listen, you know that we are Jews, said, of course." 
so why don't you take us? Then he said, listen, for us it's important that Antwerp is Judenrein. You are all blonde. We, we will take you at the end. You, you look Aryan, so you don't disturb us that much for the moment. So that's what we were all like blue eyed London. So they, they knew that you were Jewish? Yeah. We had my mama was going with the star. She was going with the star? Of course. Wasn't there a time when we took off the star? No, no, you cannot take off the so star. So because you had the Paraguay passports yeah, yeah. that who was Rekhas Tumak? Was she involved in organizing? We got this uh, the we got it through Rene. Rene and Nuchim. Rene was a sister in law. Of of uh, Recha, there were three brothers: Eli, Nuchim, and the, uh, the wow. man. And because you had the Paraguay passports, you yeah, could. Yeah, but it didn't say the other. I told you the yeah. story. All the others were killed, and my father, together with uh, two other Rottenberg's brothers, survived. Was sent to Germany, and they survived. And after the war, they came back. They lost their wives and their children, and they rebuilt themselves. They got married again, their children. So when your mother w walked to the Wehrmacht, she had a, a star yeah, on? of course. Now, with, I remember that when it all started, there was a family, um, wow. Mr. Friedman, who was the, 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 the principal of, of our children, uh, and he had the little daughter, was my friend, and I was very jealous of her because she had she was already great she she had the, the star and we I didn't, didn't have, have to it. we had the star because, because we, we were too her. small but she was already seven so i was very jealous of her because she had this beautiful star and i didn't have it i never saw her again Miriam Friedman, and with this when you were walking in the streets and your mother yeah did you ever have the germans like uh, any anti-semitic incidents or no never and uh, as you in order to tell you how children feel something we were playing there and there were the the german were exercising you know making their exercises and then i remember they took me you know excellent braids and echt a deutsches mädel you look like a real german wow. girl and when he started to speak to me in, in german now I, I understood i understood it we knew because german, we knew because german because my parents were speaking German together. Did you speak Yiddish at home as well? No, not yet by German. that time. After the war we learned the Yiddish. And um, then I knew that only I knew that only the Jews know Germany in Antwerp. I say so if I will if I will answer him or tell him then he will find out that I'm a Jew. So I told him, Kanit Verstan, Kanit Verstan, I can't understand you. But you really did. I did. Wow. So it was, uh, believe me. Your, your mother must have been a very, very courageous woman. Yeah. A very she was a hero. Really a hero. And she saved our life because, by the way, that she gave us such a good education. And officially, I tell you again, I was scared to death. And I knew. Wow. In myself, you never say that you're afraid and you don't show it. That's what I knew. And uh, that actually saved our life. And when did your, your mother know that your, her husband, your father, was, was alive? Only through, I think, this, this no, was... No, they had letters. They, they were, had letters they were corresponding. As a matter of fact, we have a beautiful letter from after the war, the end of the war, the soldiers started arriving to Antwerp from Canada, England, uh, America, America, and there were some Jewish soldiers between them as well. And somehow they heard about them, my mother, and they heard that she's kosher, and she started inviting her to the house. And before Pesach, they wanted to be invited, and she said, I'll invite you with pleasure, but I have nothing. At least if I would have some eggs, and I would be able to produce something. So one of the soldiers said, don't worry, Mrs. Fox. Mina. Yeah, yes. we'll help you. The next day he comes to our house with, I don't know how many eggs. 200 eggs. 200, I don't know exactly. <laughs> and she said, how did you get to that? He said, well, I'm a good poker player. And I said to the boys, boys, today we don't pay 
play for money, but we it was play the for girl ads. Wow. Because he had access so, to <laughs> so they, he was a good poker player, and he, she, he came back with those eggs, and we made a cedar. And this soldier actually wrote a beautiful letter to my father. Nazi, that was due to no, Stein. Due to yes. He wrote a beautiful letter to my father, who was then in uh, Algeria. And um, I have the letter somehow. It's really a beautiful. I, it's a shame that I didn't think yeah. about no, bringing I have it. it I somewhere have it maybe I can find. Mm. You should sell it because yeah. a beautiful yeah. letter. Yes. So and yeah, I, he told my ma my father about all the things my mother does. Wow. That she always laughs and that she's never tired. And you must know that at that time my mother was very sick because in the beginning of the war she, her back hurt her very much and they thought it was the appendix and they took out her appendix for nothing, she had nothing Oy. in the appendix and really she had kidney stones. Oy. So by the time that the war ended she was in a terrible situation because it burst the kidney and Oy. her whole body was full of pus. And nevertheless, she carried on doing all, all those things. And in that letter, this Dudu Stein, who was a religious soldier, asked my father for permission, that my mother asked for permission to take in two Jewish children who were taken out of the monasteries. Those were the boys, Jean, Jean and yeah. Willy. Uh, really, we. Yeah, Jean and Willy, who came to our house. And they had a religious grandfather who wanted the children to be in a religious place. And my mother had a very tough time with them because they were educated as going as Christian. Every night they went on their knees, they prayed to whatever they pray. It was very tough, but somehow they were sent afterwards to Israel, and I don't know what happened to them. And how long, how long did they stay in your home? Uh, well, uh, a certain a while. A few months, I think. Yes. My m the whole house was full of people because in '46, when people started coming back from wherever they were, some people needed houses to be. So I don't know how many refugees stayed in our house. And my father was dreaming of coming back to a quiet place. <laughs> and we finally came back to our house. It was like a hotel. It, it, <laughs> it was very, very noisy. But anyhow, that's what uh, my mother did. And your house, was it in the Jewish area? It no, was a bit outside. Outside. Yes. It was in Berchem, it's called Berchem. Mm -hmm. But it was the only Jewish home during the war. Um, yeah, and afterwards. Uh, actually, it was like that, that my mother, straight after the war, she, we were going every day to the Centrale. To find really out if some of our relatives came, came back. back. Because she, she didn't know what happened. This time. She had no idea oh, what yeah. happened to her family. So people started arriving, and she was always in the hope that maybe one of her brothers will come back or whatever. But uh, other people came back, and they came to our house. Actually, there was an elderly man that came also to our to our house, and she asked him, "How did you get here?" Then they told him at the Centrale, there is a Meshuggan woman that takes everybody, you can go there. Wow. <laughs> so he came also. I remember Eli stood in the street and he said, my mother likes soldiers, you can all come in, because he saw the house was full of, you know, those religious soldiers. No, the most were not religious, They're but they were, they were Jewish. The only one that was Dudu, really, Dudu. that was Dudu Stein, he managed the whole war not to eat one strafe. But wow. he was the only one. He said he will never eat sardines in his life anymore. <laughs> because that's what he ate. And the others actually were only interested because it was such a nice atmosphere. But then on Pesach, she said, yes, if we have a possibility not to eat chomets, they would be appreciated. And then came the story of this well, fox. The eggs who had no idea actually from Judaism, but he was very impressed and so um, we had a, a lovely Seder. And then actually, I don't think that we made a big feast, so uh, there was some we soldiers who said, I think we did have masses. masses we had, and then uh, the soldiers brought whatever we could get. It was the time where there was nothing to get in Antwerp, even if you had money. 
And then there was few soldiers said, well, if there's a possibility not to eat hummus, then my mother said, listen, so there was a big pot of, of um, potatoes on the fire. She said, you can come any time and there will be potatoes, but there was a delicatessen inside. You know what? One onion. Mm. So it was so delicious, the best potatoes I ever had in my life. And so that's what we ate. And probably we had some right. matzos also. And can I ask, when your father came back, that must have left such an indelible impression on you. It was very difficult because he came back in '46. Now just before he came back, I don't know who arranged it for those poor Jewish children who never had a holiday and so on. So we were sent to a camp where they would take care of us, my sister and me. And but Dr. Lena was there yeah. as a monitor. But unfortunately, the, um, we got typhus there because oh, the yeah. water was contaminated. It was paratyphus. Good yeah. that we had only paratyphus. So but when my father came disease. back, my sister and me had paratyphus. Mine was much worse than hers. And we were covered with uh, impetigo, if you know what that sure, is, sure. and my hair fell out completely. Right. So, and we were isolated on the top floor. They weren't even allowed to come to us. So it was a bit of a difficult time. When well, we actually, came my father and my mother came to get us in the camp, and when we got back, right. we found out that we were that we were we had paratyphus, and immediately. Practically, our father saw us, I don't know, an hour, just the time to get back to, to Antwerp. And then, actually, in we quarantine. were like in quarantine in the, in the upper floor. And uh, my mother was taking care downstairs of, of, of the family. Oh. And uh, uh, once a day, she came out, and we had an extra toilet, and she had to wash her hands and everything. She couldn't touch us. And then um, we were, we felt she was much more sick than me. I also felt horrible, but not that way at that time. And then after that, this Aunt Petigo was terrible. And then they bought butter. And they said, now you have to eat uh, bread with butter that will fit. Now, our stomach could not take the well, butter we're anymore. By it, we threw everything so, and so, so what we did always when my aunt went out of the room, we took the butter off the, the bread, we threw the butter wow. through the window and we ate dry bread. <laughs> And did the doctors come to... No, don't you remember any doctors coming? Were you uh, taking uh, medic... Did, you, did they give you medication? There was a doctor. Did was. they give you medication? There was no medication. There was... My mother, who was so sick then, there was no uh, antibiotic bed. So for half a year, she had like a bottle attached oh, to yeah. her body for, for the drainage. pus to drip out. Sure. And yeah, so that... A bit later, they would be able to take out the, the kidney because in the first operation, the kidney burst. Yes. And then she said, I'm not going to live like this. And then the doctor said, I'm not going to make your surgery. Uh, and then she said, listen, uh, and she had to sign that. She said, I'm not continue to live like this. And then they made the surgery. It was very, very long and very, very difficult because also they didn't want to give her and an, they gave her only local an anesthesia. It was really terrible because it, they were scared. And then actually the other kidney was already contaminated. That's so she problem. stayed to the rest then of her life with one kidney that not was functioning well. functional the thirty percent. So. And together with all that, she mm. was the one after the war who started, it was called Matan Buseta in Antwerp. All the people, the refugees who came back with nothing, no money to buy food. So she made a system that whoever goes to a Jewish shop pays a bit more, like let's say 10 francs more. All this money was wow. put together. My mother got the addresses of the people who need it and they were sent food without having to be ashamed, you know. And your mother organized it? Yeah. Yeah. A real stakers. And she wow. gave shiurim every week. She was an expert in Rav Hirsch. So she gave shiurim Avot, Tehilim and, and Chumash. And when the school opened after the war, she also gave shiurim. Wow. 
And, and did, you, did you stay in the house yeah. for many years afterwards? Yes. Is it very far from the, the, the no, Jewish? No, It's about 15 minutes walking from the center. Yeah. yeah. We went, I went, I took my grandchildren to that house in the Kapiermannstrat to show them the house where we were safe yeah. during, during the war. It was very interesting. And um, the houses are being kept very well because they, they are not allowed to destroy those houses because they have a, a historical... And are people there. living in there today? Uh, some go and bought the house after we sold it to them and they were very nice. They always let us in to, to show the house. I went there twice or three times. <laughs> Uh, and can I just ask, um, you, I mean, this is history, this is our history. Yeah. You must remember when the families came back to Antwerp after the war. Yeah. It must have been terrible where well, they were looking for the... Most of the people who came back were not original Dutch yeah. Antwerp people. They were refugees from all kinds of... There is the majority, the there majority of the people that, that settled in Antwerp weren't originally from Antwerp, no, no. but those who lived in Antwerp and before, one how of many... the people who came back were the people you know, Nadia and, and her husband, and so they but came they back didn't, after they the didn't, war. They didn't wear in Antwerp before, they no, were for no, Polish. That's what I'm saying. Yes, yes. They, they were not uh, Belgians. But uh, actually there was one, there was a, a very famous man who was in Antwerp before, his name was Raf Timberg. And they said that he was he was hidden somewhere. It was a very big Talmud Chochem. And was sitting and care. learning. He was lit, sitting and learning all the way. Many people say that if at all there were people that survived, it was in his house. And he came back after the war, all alone with his son who was not healthy. And then my mother took upon uh, to bring him every day a warm lunch. And she washed them every day. Yeah. There was Rabba Vrom, not Timberg. Well, I don't know. Uh, there was Rabba Vrom. Rav Timberg was in another house in the Oetbreidingstraat and he was taken anyway. care of. He just, she just brought him food. But there was another oh, very yeah, famous, uh, very fine Jew, Rabba Vrom, who was staying in our house and then he got sick. She had to wash him every day. Because at a certain moment he was so sick that um, wow. He could not help himself. And anymore. all this was when my mother wasn't well. Yeah. When her kidney had burst. Unbelievable. Away. And what did your father do when he came back? Threw out all the people that were down. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't take it anymore. But did he start working? Or what yes, did, of course. What, what type Same of work? to Madame Maria, who brought back all these diamonds that were hidden uh, under the rabbit um, cages. And then we had to fight for years with this fun loan that he would take, uh, give back some of the money. And then he gave. Oh, if we can. And have you got a picture of your father as well? Yeah, sure. If we could show this the picture. This is a picture not from many years later. My mother was around 51. In the war, she was in her 30s. Early 30s. If we could just take, show the pictures. Um, and if we yeah. could. Do you have a picture of your father? Yeah, I'm looking. Yes, you have it in the other And uh, do you have the picture of our grandparents there, Anna? Yeah. You can give them there behind. Okay. Yes, you know the one that were deported. Um. Yes, so maybe. <laughs> So this is a picture of your parents? Yeah, in later years, of course. This is my father. <coughs> Those are my grandparents who were murdered. That's a picture of your mother. <coughs> this is my mother. 
Now my father was an only child. My mother came from a family of seven children. My father was an only child. And <clears throat> um, this is our revenge on the Nazis. This is my family. So you bring we went to Kibbutz Lavi two years ago. We had oh. children together. Bli Einara. Bli sure. And uh, Rachel, in your family? Is I have a small family. <laughs> I didn't make it to have such a big family. I have uh, uh, I had three children. I have five grandchildren. Baruch Hashem. Yes. And your brothers? Well, uh, you know that one, my, uh, the third child in the house, uh, my brother Benny, that was born, um, maybe I'll tell you the story of this birth, it was very interesting. Uh, he unfortunately passed away. Um, uh, he was killed in ago. a car accident. It was yeah. called killed. How old now, was he? 38. He was 39. Yeah. So uh, this story was also very impressive. I know the story only for, because my mo mother tells. So we came back from Dünkirchen and we had some kind of an au pair girl taking care uh, of us. And then it was, um, I don't know if it was, which evening was, anyway, there were no buses and tram. So my mother had to walk to the hospital because she felt she needed to, to give birth. It was the third child, yes. And then she went with the au pair girl and she was um, going by foot at certain moment. She sat on the sideways and that's it, I can't walk anymore. So the girl started crying, you're going to give me birth here, here on the street. She said, okay, but I can't walk anymore. Then came a big truck with a uh, Wehrnacht soldier looking out, noch eine Frau für ins Spital? Another lady for, for the hospital? Now the whole uh, truck was full with pregnant lady need to go to give birth and my mother sat next to him and the girl went home and then he brought they brought me brought all these women to the hospital then she said why are you doing that then he said you know my wife is pregnant in uh, German now I took upon myself to help all the pregnant uh, women that I see and I hope that somebody will help my wife in in Germany for that and that's the way then <laughs> Benny was born, but he's not alive anymore. And um, my other brother, as you know now, he is uh, from the little, little boy that couldn't stand until he was one and a half, I don't know what. Uh, he is very, very active in the Klal work, in, in Jewish politics in Antwerp. For many, many years he has been <coughs> the president of the Consistoire, which is, you know, this um, organization that is between the Jewish community and the government. And he did that after my father, because my father himself also um, worked for the Consistoire, and he got, um, from the king there, he got the uh, Leopold order, mm -hmm. you know, which was uh, it's kind of like you would get a sir or something in, 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 in uh, England, and my brother took over and he carries on with that. He represents the Jewish communities. So I just want to ask you about um, the Antwerp community. It's a very unique, a very special and a unique community. Uh, one of the most unique communities. Which community? The in Antwerp, Antwerp. In Antwerp. Yes. We, um, many survivors came back. Um, Not many survivors. No, no, many, many people who weren't from Antwerp, but they came to Antwerp after the war. Yes. And they, they, they re-established their lives. Yeah. But they weren't originally from Antwerp. No. But they were accepted very well into... And that community is a very, very uh, close-knit, a very special yeah, kahira. Yeah. It became very Hasidish now as well. In the beginning and after the war it was less Hasidish. And now it is very Hasidish but very nice. All so, kinds of schools. So how happened. come? Because the Antwerp community People know each other. It's like a, a large family. It's a very, very special kehillah. It's a close knit. Yeah. Yeah. But you get this in South Africa as well, I think. South Africa also, but Antwerp yeah. is uh, it's it's a beautiful thing to mm -hmm. see. Yeah. Okay. So I want to ask you about you. I mean, what you've gone through and what you've experienced. What message do you give to your 
children into the future generations. What, what, from what you've experienced and what you've seen through and what you've, what you've lived through, what, what message would you give to the future generations? I would say, and this is most important, to keep your Jewish identity very, very strongly in a world that today is very divided, very not clear, and where many, uh, and we say there's the Hester Panim that's very, very strong, and people are a little bit, um, uh, really don't know where to go, and I mean with their minds, and I think that uh, keeping uh, one side Jewish identity and on the other side, uh, trying to uh, be united, not divided. Because we are all Jewish. And uh, I think uh, that if we stick together, I think the Purim story is telling us the answer. When uh, Mordechai, or when Esther said to Mordechai, Lech knos et kol ayudim, go and gather all the Jews together. This is that what Bezrat Hashem. Uh, <laughs> and I think every yeah. Jewish person is an olam latzmo. You know, what one person can do can change the whole world, which we've seen in our family, and by my father and by my mother. So I think a person does has to learn not to bow down, to keep his principles, and and. Give it over to the future generations. Baruch Hashem. I can only speak about my family. Baruch Hashem. It's Kadosh uh, Baruch Hu helped us. It's a real success. My children are different in different ways, but they all go in the same direction. I told you before, my third son has the big yeshiva with 800 students, and each of them is is very special. But but. To keep in mind that every person is a olam male, and that the whole world depends on him, and to take um, responsibility towards the world, and everyone has to do what he has to do, and Akadosh Baruch Hu will do the rest. <laughs> so I just want to thank you both. Really, it's been the greatest honor and privilege. Really, it's been such a good to to be in your beautiful home and to hear this incredible story it's just something unbelievable and i'm so grateful to both of you and you should just have muzzle brocha and Amen, you too. all of hashem's you blessings too. at maybe stream in good health and Amen. just nachas from Amen. your dear families and the nisim that your parents experience it's, yeah. it's just unbelievable so you should always have Take all of hashem's blessings granted. that's why i say you know during the war it, it's it's very <laughs> People who did the most mm -hmm. impossible things, people who did the most impossible things stayed away alive. And people who, who really did dangerous things like my mother did, she stayed alive, she had siyata dishmaya. So we have to do ishtadlis, you know, every yeah. person is obliged sure. to make ishtadlis. But you have to know that with all that, everything is in the hand of Akash Boko because he directs everything. And nowadays, in this special period we live in, maybe we can feel it even more, that we shouldn't think that whatever we do to stay alive and to be safe from what's going around us is in our hands. It's not, we have to do what we have to do, but Akash Baruch Hu really has his plan, and he's doing things we don't always understand, but in Yerch Hashem, Latid Lavo will understand, and Okay, now I have to ask you the last question. <clears throat> when your mother went through and your parents went through, I mean, losing their whole families, it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot of people can lose the emona. A lot of people did lose the emona, but a lot of people kept the emona. In your family, keeping the emona, it was it was not a problem. No. It just was it just it, there was never a suffake. There was never a doubt. I can tell you, it is a small child. Um, from one side, I knew I don't have to speak it to the other about my Judaism when I was a little. I always felt that I'm different than the others. 
that I can play outside with all kinds of children, but that I am different and growing up with the absolute emna, which I was sure that this will end, that the Kodesh Baruch Hu will save us from that, and knowing that uh, the Jewish identity is so strong in us that um, we could never imagine not, not to live according what the Torah says to us. And uh, I felt this everywhere, also when I've been living in Basel, I tried to, to do what I can do there for the community. Yeah, I do something else. But uh, this is maybe really the message that uh, um, when you pass all this, then you know that you're living every day with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. Wow. And yeah. that he is really guiding us and helping us. It's amazing. And I think another nekama for your families is that your sons established the yeshiva, which is, it's, the Wilson yeshiva is just unbelievable. It's growing and every patient or bocha that I have that I know is so happy to be there. Do you know, my, my uh, husband teaches as well and he's been, we, I told you we went to camps in South Africa, we went to camps in uh, England to see it, I don't know if you know about see it. Mm -hmm and he, he teaches in Russia. He, until now, until this pandemic, he was spending three months a year in the yeshiva in, in Russia where he teaches. So, you know, the children, you don't have to preach them. When you see what the, your father does, you learn from it. And you both got it, and your family's got it from your parents? Oh, Hashem. So thank you so much, really. I'm, it's been thank such you. a schut, such an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you so much. And for to coming. hear your most incredible story full of Nisim and uh, Niflat, really.